Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my pleasure to have Martin Sultzman here. He's uh, currently uh, assistant professor at the University of Singapore, National Univers University of Singapore. Um, he's got his PhD at Yale from, uh, with Paul Hudak. And he's had some stints in Australia and various places of the world. Of the world. And uh, so it's a great pleasure to have him here and uh, we'll learn about algebraic data types. Good. Thanks, Manuel. All right. Uh, actually, I'm in town for for Flock. So yesterday there was a, a workshop on programming languages meet program verification, but it was for toy functional languages. Um, and uh, my talk is actually about a new concept called generalized algebraic data types, and it's in the context of of Haskell. You know, so not the real world, which I saw today. Mike gave me this introduction to uh, Spec Sharp. It was really interesting. Okay, so what we're gonna, gonna do, so GLTs, I'm not sure, that's a short form for generalized algebraic data types. You might have heard, have heard from them, and uh, they actually are a very old concept. I mean, uh, for instance, Manuel would say, well, I know them a long time because he has been using something similar in fault, and uh, they have a long history in uh, independent st type communities and so on. So they're not really a new concept, but actually they found their way now in, in some languages like Haskell. And I think maybe also soon in uh, in ML. And the point of them is simply they provide the ordinary programmer with uh, enough power to state very very expressive program properties. Okay. So in the first part of my talk, I just take a look at at a few examples of of GDTs. Okay. And then in the second part, I'll look at the type inference. It's always one of my my hobbies. Uh, type inference. So I believe it's 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 good to automatically infer types which are imposed by program text. And uh, from Hindley Milner, we, we know that uh, the type inference is sounding complete, but it turns out that actually for GAT inference, it's a to whole, uh, totally different uh, game. Then I look into how to translate uh, GAT to system F. So the standard technique in languages like, let's say, Haskell, or in compilers like uh, GHC, is that we have this Hindley Milner style source language which would be translated to, to a system F. And of course, the question is now, GLTs are an extension to, uh, to system F. And uh, what does this mean to, to the source language? Okay. Can we still use system F, or do we have to extend system F? Okay. All right, so here's actually a classic e example. And uh, I'm just curious, how many of you actually know Haskell? So it's just so pretty much everybody um, but those. Um, so effectively, this is a specification of an algebraic data type. So we have here a, a data type expression of A, and uh, we have a bunch of constructors, like the zero constructor, which represents just zero. We have the successor constructor, which takes an expression, gives us a new expression. We have the plus constructor, uh, constructor. then we have fun, which builds a function. We have application, which takes a function and argument. And we have lift, which eff effectively allows us to lift uh, variables to the expression language. So the technical thing is here, actually, I'm using high-order abstract syntax, which you might also not know. But the interesting thing here is that um, this is not quite a classic algebraic data type. Because if you look at the, the types of the constructors, for instance, zero has type expression of int. And if you look at, say, at, at the function, it has expression of a function type, b goes to c. Okay. And usually the condition we have for algebraic data types is that the, the types of the uh, data types must be the same. Okay? So there's something strange uh, going on. That's actually the power of these generalized algebraic data types. Now, what we can do with them is, effectively what I've been doing here with this little uh, GLT for expressions, I've been encoding a, a simple uh, language that it has a simple type, uh, uh, type system. And now what I'm doing is here, I'm writing a little evaluator. Maybe for a moment, you just ignore the type annotation, because the definition here is just what you expect. If I evaluate 0, I evaluate to actually the, the 0 number. If I evaluate the successor, 
I evaluate actually first the, the, the expression here, and then I simply add one. If I, if I have a function, what I'll do is I actually create a function. I'm using here high order abstract syntax. Effectively, I lift the, the, uh, the variable x into the expression language and apply f to that, to that expression. If I have application, what I'll do is I evaluate the, the, uh, the function and I evaluate the argument, and I simply apply that result as, as we expect, okay, for, for a very simple big step style interpreter. Now, the interesting thing is, in fact, the, the type annotation, because that type annotation states something very curious about our, our expression language. It simply says an expression of type A evaluates to a value of type A, okay? So intuitively, you would actually say this should not be well typed, because it means for any A, and it seems to break here the right-hand side of the first clause where we actually return an integer, okay? And that's actually the trick of these generalized algebraic data types because when I do the pattern matching over zero, in fact, I'm not saying anymore it's for any A. It's actually the A where the A is bound by int that's up there, okay? So effectively, it's some sort of type case. So we do some sort of uh, type case depending on the, the constructor, okay? And of course, the, the nice thing is now we can state much stronger properties about our programs. So that's, that's a really nice thing. Okay, uh, roughly what we, how we could describe these GDTs is some sort of boxed existential type with equality guards. So I just was highlighting here again the, uh, the two constructors which do not share the same type. So zero has a type expression of integer and the function constructor has the type expression of uh, B goes to C, okay? Now, if you would actually write down explicitly the types of these constructors, you see what I mean by uh, existential types with, with equality guards, okay? Because, for instance, in this case here, we have here the equality guard that A is nothing else than a function from B to C. And also we see that, in fact, the B and the C do not actually ap appear in the, in, the, uh, in the output type, so that's why we, in fact, call this actually an existential type, okay? All right? So if roughly that's, in fact, now uh, how we could describe these GDTs. Okay. Now, as I said, with these GDTs, what we can do, in fact, is we can, in this case, we simply encode the typing rules of a very, well, of a simply typed language, effectively. That's what I'm doing. So the constructor is effectively a proof, you know? So if you think about it, the zero constructor just says, well, I'm an int. Then the function constructor says, well, I simply I take a function. And the application constructor simply says, I take my function argument, and uh, sorry, I take my function, and I take my argument, and I give you back actually an expression, OK? That's just a neat way, in fact, how to encode, in this case, typing rules via GATs. All right, so let's come back to the issue what I said before, that if you look at the, the actual uh, definition of the eval function, which is nothing else than a big step interpreter, I would say it's just a natural definition, okay? But we have to convince ourselves that this is meant to type check, okay? Because from Hindle Milner, we know if I, if I write a polymorphic type scheme, this would here definitely be a contradiction. Because I say here for any A, I return an A, but in this case, it's of course, zero is of type int. It's a contradiction. The point is here, when I do the pattern matching over the zero, which I highlighted here, we in fact use these equality guards, okay? So they're not that explicit in actually the, the actual GDT syntax in GHC, but they are there, because effectively it means really the A is constrained by int, okay? So in fact, when we're gonna type here the right-hand side, when we di did the pattern matching, we do know that A is actually int, okay? And of course, we can use this type information now to change the type, okay? Because we know that zero is an integer, we have the, the assumption that a is an int, and that's why I can simply change the type of 0 to a, okay? So that's why this is perfectly well typed. Now, again, the tricky point is, of course, you, you would say that a equals int doesn't float out, you know? It doesn't poison the other branches, okay? That means it's only available when we do the pattern matching over 0 on the right-hand side of that first clause. And effectively, that's what, how would the type checking works here for all the different clauses, okay? Just like a, a rough, rough uh, overview of how this works. 
Now, there's even a, a recent paper by, I think, Andrew Kennedy, and uh, I think it's, I forgot the second author. Uh, they were also adding something similar uh, to C-sharp, so effectively the same concept of GADTs, okay? And it's quite interesting. So, in fact, any form of, if you have any form of algebraic data types, you can generalize this form by effectively constraining the constructors by equality gods, okay? And really the, 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 the main gag is here, they can be, that, that you can take advantage of these equality guards when we're going to type, type a, a function and when we do the pattern matching. All right, so this actually is a classic example because most papers or almost all papers on GLATs, you, you'll find it. So this is really overusing it, but I'll, I'll show you a bit more. Now, I was making the point that with these GLATs, we can state, well, effectively what we can do is we can type more programs. I mean, that's what, what I've been showing you here, okay? Uh, we couldn't have typed this program without GATTs because simply that type annotation would be effectively uh, too polymorphic, you know, in, in classic Hindle Milner, but it works with the GATT typing rules. Now, what I want to also show is, in fact, that we can actually use GATTs for, for program verification, okay? And the, the cool thing is, what you already saw before, we can actually use GATTs to, to, uh, to capture proof systems, okay? So here's, a, again, a very simple and very classic example. Effectively, what I'm doing is here, I have here a, a GDT sum, which takes three parameters, A, B, and C. And effectively, what I'm doing is here, I, I encode here summation. That means sum A, B, C encodes the property that, that A plus B equals C. Okay? There is actually something which I left out on the slides. I'm actually using here singleton types to represent numbers. Okay, actually, I missed it on the slide. So effectively, what I can do in a language like Haskell, in most language, I can introduce a type which is singleton. Like data C is just like a singleton type which represents zero. And data S of A simply is a singleton type that rep represents the, suc the suc uh, successor. That's, in fact, how I uh, encode here numbers. OK, so if we would use that G to T here, effectively, what we're doing is here, we're representing proofs that capture the fact that sum of A plus B equals C, you know? So the axiom would be the base axiom that we know that if, if I add zero to any A, we know it remains the A, okay? Effectively, that's an, that's an axiom, okay? And if we do know that A plus B equals C, then we, in fact, do the induction step, then we do know that the successor of A plus B equals the successor of C, okay? Effectively, this is a, a, a downcut version of the piano axioms, just for, for natural numbers. All right, and if I look then at the term, the, the value, like step of step of base, effectively it re represents a proof for the property that successor of successor of zero plus a is nothing else than the successor of successor of a. Okay? It means if I add any. Uh, 2 to any number, I get, well, that number plus 2, okay? All right, okay, so what I can, can do now is now I, I can use these GLTs, these proofs, to again state stronger properties about my programs, okay? So here is now the append function, which is now written in, in the Haskell-style language. So what does append do? It simply takes two lists and just appends them, yeah? So if you ignore here the, the first argument for a moment, it's just the, the typical inductive definition what you expect. So if I append nil with, with anything else, with a list of y's, then I get back y's. If I uh, see a non-empty list, what I'll do is I append the tail to the y's, and then, of course, I, I, I add, I const the first element to that resulting list. Okay? That's the the obvious, the standard inductive uh, definition of append. So what I do it differently, or in addition here, is I'm using now here my, my GLT that represents a proof that A plus B equals C. And I'm also using now a refinement, uh, again a GLT, that states a stronger property about lists, okay? So I'm not only stating that my list has, well, a nil, it means empty, and it has a cons, which takes an element and the tail, but also I'm having here a, a somewhat additional parameter, N, that keeps track of the length of the list, okay? Because in this case, what I'm having here is that nil, of course, we know it's a list of length zero. If I have cons, I do know that the tail list has some length m, 
And of course, if I count anything to that list, I get a, link, a list of length successor of him. Okay? Now, what I'm doing here is now, I passing in addition the proof that L plus M equals N. And what I'm stating here is now that if I append two lists, I do know that the length of the output list is nothing else than the sum of the two input lists. Okay? This is, in fact, now effectively programming with proofs. Okay? So I really know pass in the proof that L plus M equals N, and I take use of that fact. For instance, in this case, it's very crucial that I have here the base case, because, of course, in this case, I do know that L is actually equal to zero. Okay? And, of course, in this case, I would, again, get a contradiction in Hindley Milner, because I claim Y is a list of length M, and the output list is actually of length N. But, of course, if I have here the pattern matching over the base case, I actually do know that if L is equal to zero, M is equal to N. It was written up here. OK? All right. So effectively, the, what this shows is now with GDTs, you have, in fact, a way to add proofs to your program okay, and state such stronger properties. OK? All right. So of course, now we could go ahead and, uh, and look at a lot of, let's say, in this case, uh, functions that manipulate lists. So here I have maybe the half function, which drops every second element from, from, from a list. Okay? Um, ignore the, the question marks. I mean, the definition of the half function should be straightforward. If, if my list is empty, half of, of an empty list is, is empty. If I have half of a list with at least two elements, what I'll do is I take half of that tail list, drop the second element, and, and then that's my final result. Okay? Now, what I would like to state, of course, is that I would like to use now my GAT, my proof, to state, of course, that the length of the output list is, is indeed just half the length of the input list. Okay? So what, what I want to say is, in fact, here, that I, that I know that M plus M equals N, which just has the half property. Now, the funny thing is, in fact, now, this, what I want to show is here, this shows here a kind of weakness of these GDTs, because uh, this representation of summation is not strong enough because the problem here is we cannot prove that if m plus m equals 0, it implies m equals 0, okay? what we effectively would need for, for the first case. Okay? And in the second case, in fact, we would need the property that if m plus m equals n plus 2, sorry, this actually means implication. Okay? So what it means, in fact, there is it means that there exists an m such that m is m prime plus 1, and we do know that m prime plus m prime equals n. That's the property I would need to verify it for a second clause. Okay? So it's just not strong enough here. Okay, of course, what I can do is now, as I said, I can always invent new proof systems. I could just now use a, a special purpose proof system which, which encodes the half property. Okay, yes? Yeah, that's to the sum. Um, yeah, I, I get back to this. I mean, that's, um, so effectively, here we have here a special proof system that encodes the half property. This GAT is nothing else than what I was just saying here. Okay? And I just use now that proof, that proof system, in fact, to verify that that half function really takes away half of the elements. Okay? Now, it's a bit annoying that if I, if I use all these GDTs, I sometimes can't use you know, my basic axioms I have. I mean, usually, if you think about, if we reason about natural numbers, we have our piano axioms, and every, actually, everything actually should follow from the piano axioms. Okay? But it seems to he, here I have to actually always use some special proof systems. Okay? Now, effectively, what you would like to do is, in fact, to, to specify a lemma that says that the sum of, there's actually a typo, sorry, okay? that the sum of m plus m equals n, then, of course, it implies that we can also get a proof of the half property. Now, this is, of course, what I'm pointing out here is a bit of a criticism of, of GDTs, okay? Because they're very cool. We can program with proofs, but they don't give us everything for free. Because here, I really would like to have maybe a theorem prover with tactics, okay? Effectively, what I need to do is here, I have to prove this lemma by hand, doing induction. Effectively, I have to write a program which re re represents a proof for that little lemma. And even I was trying it, okay? I was actually just trying it uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, still jet lagged and 10 hours ahead or so, so I didn't quite uh, could figure it out. But it's just too tedious, you know. I mean, uh, I think it's possible, okay. 
but it's, it's, it's really clumsy, okay? So the point is here really that uh, this is actually strictly something which should come for free from, from a proof assistant. Okay, so this is just now a little bit a, a short summary uh, of what GGTs are about. So as I said, they, they're nothing really novel, you know? So they have a long history in, uh, in the dependent types community. And I think the novelty is just that for the ordinary programmer, like the Haskell programmer, can now program with proofs. I mean, like programming with proof was always something which was uh, just uh, exclusive to, let's say, people who were using COC or so. But it's really now the ordinary programmer. Okay? As I said, I was telling you this in the context of, of a Haskell-style language, but um, any sort of language that supports algebraic data types, you could generalize them. And I think even if you would use the extension of Andrew Kennedy and I think, yeah, I forgot the it's Claudia Russo. Um, you could effectively do the same in, in that extension of C-sharp, okay? Now, the good thing is, of course, we can now, as the ordinary programmer, we can now state properties for, for which we actually used to have a external proof assistant like COC or ELF, ELF and, and 12, okay? And that's, of course, often very annoying if I have to switch to an external proof assistant to make my proofs. It's much more convenient if I can stay in the same environment. I can use the same language I write programs also to, to specify proofs, so that's quite neat. But what I was saying on the, on the, on the previous slide before, it's still non-trivial to reason about GDT proofs. You know, what I was showing you with the exponentiation of sum, I would actually have to provide lemma to get, you, to, get uh, to the exam for half. And that's, in fact, still too tedious if I have to do it each time myself, because I really want to have a proof system with tactics that maybe assists me here. OK, so this is actually pretty much the, the first uh, third of, of my talk just a bit of the, introduce the concept of, of GDTs. Now, when we talk about uh, Hindley-Milner languages, uh, we usually care about inference, okay? So a language like, like Haskell supports actually type inference, and we would like to say, uh, no, do we get properties like completeness or decidability, okay? So the next question will be, is actually GDT type inference uh, complete, okay? And of course, for any language, something like any compiler, even for in, in the ML world, it's these days well established. We're going to use a type intermediate language, and as a standard, we, we use these days system F. Okay? So the question is then, how do we actually uh, translate GDTs to system F? Okay? So at this point, I want to say, because when I talk about type inference, actually, it's proven already by myself and independently also by Jenny Hinze and uh, Portier that the GDT type checking is decidable. That means if I provide the annotation, it's actually decidable. OK, actually, the, the bad news is, OK, I have to imagine I'm an academic, so I, I live with, uh, with contrived examples. So here's actually a contrived example that proves for the first time that GDT inference is incomplete and decidable. That's really a shock, you know? Because usually we are used to, if you remain in the Hindley Milner fragment, and even if you add extensions, you know, I mean, there were a lot of extensions added to Hindley Milner over time. Like, uh, I mean, okay, algebraic data types, uh, box existential types, records, and so on. And usually, always, we could uh, retain the nice properties, like completeness and principal types. Okay? But here is now a totally contrived GDT program that shows you that that function f here can be given an infinite set of maximal types. Okay? What is a maximal type is simply a type for which one there is no more general type. Okay? So effectively, all these types, okay, I'm not going to go through in detail, because it's just too tedious, because I didn't really formally just tell you the, 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 the GAD typing rules, you know. If you don't trust me that these are valid types, you can do this offline, you know. It just, you know, it's, it, it, it just shows you all these types actually are valid, and none of them is, is, uh, is smaller than the other. So they're all incomparable. And here's another one, okay? So, yeah, that's actually one. Uh, I'll show you this later, okay? We will, I mean, at this point, I'm not going to tell you, but I will tell you later why these types are, are correct, okay? The puzzling thing actually is, the puzzling thing is maybe that we suddenly have some character, you know, in the output type. So if you look at that function, all what it does, it takes x and y, okay? And, and on the left-hand side, I cons x to y. So the colon actually is the cons operation in, in, uh, in, in Haskell, okay? So x colon y is nothing else than the cons. So, so we would definitely expect that we get back a list, okay? And most likely, I think, you would intuitively say that this is the correct type. Because what you would expect is here that we have here x has type t of x. And because I cons x to y, 
that means y must be a list of t, t of x's. Okay? And somehow that third parameter, z, doesn't really matter here, you know. I even don't, don't, don't have a, a variable. I mean, z only appears in the type, you know. So obviously this would be definitely the intuitive type, I would say. But strangely enough, we get also all these types, okay? And of course, the, the thing is, the, 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 the tricky point is here, because of these GATs, when I do the pattern matching over the K, I do actually know that the Z is actually a character, okay? So if I would have just written erg of X, Y, and written Z, okay, not character, then this would be the only type, okay? But because I have written erg of X, Y, and character, I do know when I do the pattern match, I actually have this, this equality guard that says Z equals a character, okay? And under this assumption, of course, I can do some weird thing. And we'll look into this later, why we actually end up with all these types, okay? But of course, it's, it's a devastating news, you know? It's, it, it shows that, uh, of course, in, in practice it won't happen, you know? With, with all counterexample, uh, they, they will only appear for contrived, I mean, sorry, these problems only appear for, for contrived counterexamples. So, um, okay, that, there's some further bad news, okay? From Hindle Milner, we do know that uh, if you have a, a principal type derivation, we do know that all the subderivations are principal. Actually, this is the, the critical point to establish completeness of, of algorithm W, okay? That's the, the key point to, to verify that. Now, GDTs do not enjoy this property, okay? So, the the, the previous example we're going to investigate in, examine in detail, okay? So I, I fear I would run out of time if I go through this example in detail, so I will discuss this offline. So roughly the intuition is here actually that here that uh, function g has the principal type list of list of, list of, of character, okay? But strangely enough, that f in fact can be given one of the maximal types w which we have seen before, okay? Effectively, this breaks the property that which you know from Hindley Milner that if you have a principal typing derivation, all the subderivation must be principal. Okay? So I just skip over that and we look you now at um, at previous works on, on GAD type inference. Okay? So how can we in fact now maybe restore some sort of the nice properties? So there's one attempt that was by Simonet and Potier. And effectively the idea is now that we obtain complete type inference by enlarging the set of expressible types, okay? So, again, that I just want to show you some funny type, and we'll see later where this funny type is coming from. So that funny type usually is funny because we're using here a implication among equations. So usually from Hindley Milner, we, we are used to that the constraints that appear in type schemes must be conjunction of constraints, okay? But here, in fact, what we do have is here an implication. And effectively, this is the literate constraint generated by the GADT. And we just take this as the, uh, the, the, the type. So in fact, this is the complete type. But of course, the trouble is types become unreadable. I don't want to present this type to, to, a, to a user. And there's an, a more serious issue that actually we have a non-elementary complexity of the inference algorithm. Okay? The problem is simply it's not anymore just solving of, uh, of, of equational constraints, but we have to solve these very, very complicated uh, uh, implication constraints. And then we have a non-elementary uh, complexity. Okay, so recently, there are actually now two competitive approaches. One is by uh, Peyton Jones and uh, some colleagues, and the other is by Potier and one of his students. And Potier says, I want to stratify the problem, okay? As I argued before, if you have a completely fully annotated program, the type checking part is, is, is completely indecidable, okay? So we do know that in this case, we do get the nice properties, but of course, Nobody wants to uh, only program with such programs because there are too many annotations, you know. I mean, as much as possible, we would like to relieve the user from the burden of, of annotating the program with, with, the, with the right an annotations, okay? Now, why they call it certified type inference, they say for the fragment where we, where we have complete annotations, we know we get completeness and decidability, okay? But what we want to do is maybe having some heuristics, you know, in, in practice, a programmer is not willing to completely annotate a program. And what they're having is here, they're having some, on, some heuristics to infer missing annotation, giving a partially annotated program, okay? So this is, of course, somehow an approach that gives up on, 
on, on inference, you know, because it's in a, a heuristic. Uh, sorry, it gives up on deterministic inference, you know. You're not sure whether your program, uh, sorry, that heuristic will actually succeed or not, you know. So it's not a very nice property. And even worse is that that even is not stable. That means if you have a program and for which the heuristic actually could succeed and could infer the missing annotations, strangely enough, if you add more annotations which are all correct, that heuristic might not succeed anymore. Okay? It's a very strange, strange property. Uh, what is actually is implemented in, 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 in GHC is something a little bit between this, these heuristics and uh, a completely uh, fully annotated program. It's called wobbly type inference. So the idea is, in fact, now that we can only use these refinements, that means these, these equality guards, if actually the function has been an annotated. Okay? So it's, in fact, a, a compromise. So if I have my evolve function from before with the type annotated, the GDTs come into action. Okay? Otherwise not. Okay? Again, some reasonable programs are rejected, and it, this, the whole system is not stable if we provide more, more annotations. Okay. Um, so what I'm doing is now here is I show you what I've done with, with, with two colleagues, and this is something which is a total novel inference approach, okay? Because what you expect is that it, it's something not any more standard Hindley Milner, okay? Uh, we're having here a problem where we, we are suddenly getting incomplete inference, and, uh, well, sorry, we're getting uh, a program, an innocent program with an infinite number of maximal types, okay? So the, we have to somehow tame the system, okay? Effectively is we, we have to tame the type system in such a way that we that we can rule out nonsensical types or solutions. Okay, so here I equate often when you know from Hindley Milner to, to compute the type, you actually compute the solutions via unification. Okay, but of course here we can't anymore use the standard uh, solving algorithm which we know from Hindley Milner like unification. And what I'm showing here you is in fact is a problem that we can do it with something which is called Herbrand constraint abduction. Okay. So abduction is something which has some long history by some philosopher peers, and the basic idea is we have to infer the missing facts. Okay. All right. So, Question? yeah. I don't know anything about types. So yeah. I'll just ask a dumb question. So, in, in, the, in the previous examples, when you had this definite set of maximal types, mm -hmm. but, but but all but one of them are nonsensical. Yes. Why are they nonsensical? I, I get to this point because I was actually I was already telling you too much in fact, at this stage. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but, the, but, but, but in general, all but one will be nonsensical. Yeah, I will tell you in fact why I would claim that they are nonsensical. Okay. okay. So now we're looking at the, that that problem which we briefly observed by looking at the, our toy example more in detail. Okay. So this is the example from before, where I try to convince you that a reasonable type or a sensible type for this program would be, because we have x has a type t of x, and we cons. Uh, x to y, I would expect that y has a type list of t of x. Okay, that was the sensible type. But we have to, in fact, realize that the typing what we do is we type under temporary assumption. Okay, so I'm doing now a bit of a big step. I'm not showing you, in fact, the typing rules. I'm showing you actually here now a formula which represents the typing rule. Okay, so that's in fact an abstraction. So, and the problem is here, as I said, when we do, for instance, the typing for Hindley Milner, we do know all the formula we need are only conjunction of, of equations, okay? But of course, here, when we do the pattern matching over a GLDT, that equality guard is only, lo let's say, uh, locally visible. So, that means the formula we do actually need here are implications, okay? So, effectively, this means under the temporary assumption that the type of set T set equals char, we're going to type the right-hand side, okay? So this is here the symbol for, for implication, okay? And the right-hand side demands, of course, that the type of Y must be a list of X's, okay? Now, you hopefully, so effectively you can argue now here that the left-hand side are the constraints arising from the GDD pattern match, and the right-hand side constraints are nothing else than the standard hindley milne constraint, okay? And of course, the left-hand side constraints and implication is a novel part, the, the, the GDT part. Okay, um, <clears throat> sorry, maybe we, we look again why we have all these funny types. And of course, then you see here, I can now type this under this temporary assumption. That's why I get all these funny types from before, okay? And what I will sh argue later is 
that we have to tame the system. Okay? And for that, in fact, I introduced you know, this, context, this, this, this uh, context, uh, concept, so-called Herbrand constraint abduction. Okay? Because from Hindle Milner, we, we're used to that we only solve equations, conjunction of equations. That's actually so-called so the Herbrand constraint domain. Okay? So here, in fact, now we have to solve these implication constraints. So, of course, what we try to do is here, the solutions which we want to accept are only those which we know from Hindley Milner, the Herbrand constraint domain. Because previously I was making the point that the work by Simone and Poitier actually was recovering, in fact, um, complete type inference by enlarging the set of expressible types in the sense that the formula we need to express the typing problems are also the formula we accept in our type system. But that's not what we want to do. It's just becoming not any more tractable, okay, and the types become un unreadable. All right. Now, what I'm trying here to do is now here is I first argue that all these solutions which we saw from before which correspond to these infinite set of, of, of types are indeed solutions, okay. By solutions, I simply mean that <clears throat> these guys actually imply that implication constraint. I simply use the standard law that if I have a formula C1 implies another formula C2 implies C3, I can pull out the implication and build a conjunction. That means it holds if and only if C1 and C2 implies C3. Okay? So that means if I want to verify that this is indeed a solution, okay? Yes? So I don't see actually why Tx uh, must be a list of Tz. So you first you say. So this is actually from the Hindle Milner, you know. X, X cons Y tells me that TY must be a list of TX. Yes, but I don't see where the Z comes in, the type of Z. TZ. The, the TZ is by, is, comes from the GLD pattern match, remember? But it's, it seems like completely unrelated to yeah, X. Of course, and y, right? exactly, exactly. And this is. Look, this is a contrived example. It's actually to, totally unrelated. But in your, in your next slide, you say. Tx equals, and then list of Tz. Yes, yes, but but the why is that? that that's like now you relate them. Yes, but I'm just uh, trying to verify that these are indeed solutions. You know, I only know. Oh, oh, you're oh. saying if they were to be related, yes, they still work out. Yes, oh, so yeah. maybe, so I'm just trying to argue that the types from before. You know, sorry, um, here. Okay, I should have repeated the type annotation. What I'm trying to do is now is, is that these types, they must come from some solutions. Okay? And I'm now only briefly argued why this is actually, these are valid types. And I'm arguing now is they come from, from these solutions. And now here on that slide, I'm now verifying that these solutions which correspond to these types are all okay. They are actually indeed solutions. And I'm simply applying that law. And I simply can now easily verify that that this is actually equivalent to that. I mean, I'm not going to go through the details. You can just easily verify that formula. Okay? It effectively, it shows. Now, of course, somehow the T set is totally unrelated to the to the T Y and the T of X. You know, but that's kind of a strange thing, and that's why we get all these too many solutions effectively. Now, what would be a sensible way to to tame the system? Because as I said, here we have the problem that we have too many solutions. Okay. So in order to, to, uh, to recover uh, completeness, okay, or even maybe de well, desirability, we have to tame the type system. Okay? We should throw away so solutions, okay? because we have here too many solutions. So the hope is, of course, if we find the sensible restrictions, we do know that the, the maximal solutions we find, they become actually finite. Okay? Now, I'm arguing now that the type we saw from before, and again, I'm sorry, I didn't really repeat that, so it's here. So here, that type from before, I'm arguing now it's a sensible type. Okay? And I'm trying to argue this in terms of, of this type coming from a solution. Okay? And I'm arguing now that that solution is sensible. Okay, So I'm arguing the solution is sensible because it can be concluded from the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Okay? Remember, the left-hand side are the the equality guards from the GDD pattern matches, and the right-hand sides are the Hindemiller typing constraints. So we have a Tz equals char implies Ty is a list of Tx's. Okay? Now, the argument is here, 
t of y equals t of x is of course clearly a solution. Okay, I hope you, you agree. But additionally then, the nice property is we can conclude that solution if we just build the conjunction of the left hand side and the right hand side. Okay? So it's definitely not stronger. And the intuition is here now that we're not inventing anything arbitrary. It was already there in the program. Effectively, the program contains all the information. But this, these solutions, which are in fact these, the ones which, are, which screwed us up, the ones which are this infinite number of maximal solutions, they're not sensible. Because we cannot follow them from the left hand side and the right hand side. Okay? Because they, they establish this arbitrary connection between, in fact, here's a typo, so it should be T, T Z, sorry. They establish this arbitrary connection bet between, between uh, uh, T Z, T X, and T Y. Okay? All right. Now, and this is now the main, the main idea of that method I was developing. I forgot to mention this before. It's together with Peter Stuckey and Tom Shrivers. Uh, this is not a method, the main idea how, to, how we want to tame that, uh, that GDT uh, type system. Because if we can now throw away all the solutions which cannot be concluded from the left hand side and the right hand side, we can actually rely on an, a nice result that says that all these solutions that we get must be finite. Okay? And of course, Sorry, all the maximum solutions are finite. And of course, if we have a finite set of maximum solutions, at least we can recover, uh, we can ra we can recover completeness and decidability. Okay, so we cannot recover uh, um, principal types in general. Okay, but at least completeness and decidability can be recovered. Sorry, yeah, okay, sure. It's just the terminology. Okay, but of course, if you have an infinite set, I mean, that doesn't 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 make sense. Okay, so here I have, I, have, I have a contrived example, okay, where I just play through the algorithm, okay. And this is just a contrived uh, uh, program where I have a GDT and I have two clauses where I pattern match over the i and the b, and, and in, in the, the first clause I constrain the type of x to be int, and in the second clause I constrain the type of, of uh, x to be boolean, okay. So typing-wise I can express the typing property of this program in terms of these implication constraints, okay? I also didn't really, I only glanced over this. I mean, I also have to take it by faith that this is a, is a, a faithful, a full and faithful abstraction of the typing properties, okay? It can also be formally proven, okay? I'll give a later reference. Now, the idea is now how to, how to perform inference via this constraint abduction method is we simply, for each individual branch, what we'll do is we simply compute the sensible solutions, okay? And of course, we, here in this case, we'll only look at the maximal ones. So as I said, we only look at the solutions which can be concluded from the left-hand side conjoined with the right-hand side. If I take a equals int and t equals int, I can actually conclude t equals a and t equals int. Okay? And in fact, both are, bar, are indeed uh, also solutions, so I call them sensible. Okay? And similarly, for the, the second branch, I do the same thing. Okay? Again, there is actually an algorithm which does it for me. You know? That means if I have a base implication, I can apply an algorithm that gives me the finite set of sensible maximal solutions. Okay? Now, of course, I have to yet do something, you know, because I have to create a solution for the overall prob uh, problem. And the, the idea simply here is that we simply test all combinations. You know, this is just a brute force method. So each of the branches gives us a finite set of, of maximal solution to get a solution to the overall uh, uh, typing problem, we just test all combinations. Okay? So we just test all the combinations we have, and of course you already see that only this one, this combination, is actually one which is a valid candidate. And uh, Sorry, valid in a sense it's also a, a maximal, maximal solution. Okay? So that means based on that principle, for that contrived program, we, we get that this function f has a principal type, erg t of t goes to t. Remember, this type is only principal if we throw away the nonsensible solutions. Okay? Right. And of course, the nice thing is we can recover some sort of inference. For instance, none of the other approaches, what I mentioned before, would be able to infer the type of this program. Okay? All right, so you would say this is totally contrived because <laughs> you, you've only seen contrived examples before. I mean, uh, what this, this deal about abduction. I mean, if I only can. Uh, improve the inference for for contrived program. Is it worthwhile the effort? You know, maybe that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, for a theoretician, it's definitely worthwhile. Okay, but actually, it has it has uh, um, more uh, more implications. I, I, I feel okay, and the main point. 
Yeah. So if you do this and you get uh, more than one uh, maximal candidate, yeah. then you could just uh, at least uh, require at that point the type annotation that's uh, where only one of the, the maximal candidates are an instance. Sure, you can do all the analysis actually. I, I'm getting to this point, so maybe, not sure wh whether you mean what I want to say, but... So it, it could also uh, give you a, be a much better description of where type annotations are necessary. Yes, exactly, but even here in fact, I, actually I'm making a different point now. Maybe this all would have also been yeah, reversible. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. But, yeah, but in fact here the point I even want to make is that um, this, this inference via abduction method is even useful for type error diagnosis, okay? Because of course, before I, I was only showing you these these contrived examples where I I can Im improve over over existing approaches. Okay, now here I show you now the example from before where I was using the the sum GDT to prove that the append function actually or the the length of, of the output list is actually the sum of the two input lists. And I was actually making here a mistake. You know, if you look at the first clause, I if you ignore the first uh, proof term parameter. Appending nil and wise should give me nil. It should should be wise. Okay, so that's definitely a, a programming mistake. Now the thing is that we can actually now use this inference via abduction method to precisely explain why this shouldn't type check. Okay, because here if you look at the the first clause again, if you do the the type abstraction via implication constraint, it would follow. It would uh, yield the following implication constraint. It says for any L, M, N, and actually there's no A, it's a typo. So that means drop that. For any L, M, and N, and I've of course simplified it, if M equals N and L equals Z, then we must conclude that N is equal to Z. Okay? Which is of course clearly not the case. Okay? But the trick is here now, this is of course a proof, or sorry, this is an incorrect statement. Okay? But now we can, in fact, use abduction to, to come up with a maybe correct proof, okay? Because if, if we would know, in fact, if you apply that method, if, you, in, if we ignore the, the quantifiers, we, in fact, find that m equals z would be a sensible solution, okay? So if we take here m equals n, l equals z, and n equals z, then we, in fact, can conclude that m equals z is actually a sensible solution, okay? Now, you can use this either to provide a concise type error message, okay? This is really useful, I think. Or even you could do, in fact, do you, you can even insert a runtime check. Because the fact that we return a nil doesn't mean that that program always will fail. It actually, it is only technically incorrect if you look at the type annotation if the second input list is empty, you know? And that, that's effectively what the sensible solution stands for, you know? So we could actually turn it into a runtime check. So also this has actually, uh, some relations to work on proof repair because there are people working on on trying to repair proofs by using abduction and in fact here again I'm just using now trying to use abduction to to repair a, a ill type program effectively okay so that's that would be also a possible ap ap uh, application all right so the the the, thir the the second third of my talk just short sh short summary um, GAT type info is just a hard problem, so we, we, cannot, we cannot hope to accept all pro, pro, uh, programs and, and, uh, and obtain complete type inference. So one possible solution what I was showing you here is actually we just rule out nonsensical solution. I mean, that's actually a classic, a classic approach. If there are too many solutions, the system is too powerful, we just have to throw away solutions. Okay? This is actually written up in a paper with uh, Tom Schreiber and Peter Stuckey. You can find it on my, ho on my, on my homepage. Okay, so in the, the second part, what I want to briefly uh, show you is in how we actually can translate it. Yes? Do the, um, when you rule out all these nonsensical solutions, mm -hmm. does that correspond at all to syntactic constraints you could put on uh, Program. Definitions on the program definitions to, that would, you know, rule out those nonsensical solutions in the first place. Like for instance, in that contrived example, it seems, I mean, you're introducing a, a type that, that's not actually constraining anything or being used. Yes, of course. I mean, I don't. Okay, in real programs, let's say that use GDTs, I I couldn't find 
a program which has an infinite set of maximal types. So it's, it all seems to work smoothly. So it's, at this stage, it's, it's just an academic, an academic problem. But I just want to point out that that technique of, of inference via Herbrand constraint abduction and looking at sensible solution is actually useful for, for proof repair. Okay? So effectively, it's, it's something which, which allows you to solve an academic problem, but also I think it has practical consequences. It's really useful. So, yeah. It would not be used to remove the, the non-compositionality or uh, uh, non-stability of the current algorithms? No, it's actually by definition stable and compositional. When I restrict myself to, to sensible solution, it's also one, one, one trick I play. Because I, I really tame the system such that it's really by definition uh, compositional. So, so that means that this would be huge improvements if DHC would have it. Of course. Because it's a big, I sure. think the, the, the compositionality and stability is a big thing that makes at the moment really hard. No, definitely, definitely. So, but as I said, I mean, I don't have strong arguments to, well, to, to argue with Simon because I only have these, let's say, contrived example where it matters. But I believe that for type error diagnosis, it's, it's an issue. So, and the, the problem is, of course, if you look at a huge system with, like GHC, you try to not do something too costly when you add GHCs and you do inference. You know, effectively, the current GHC solution is, is a cheap way out. You know, to get a reasonable inference system with a minimal amount of effort in, involved. So what I've been actually showing you here with, um, with, the, with let's say, with using implication constraint and doing Herbrand constraint abduction, it really deviates from the total standard uh, approach how you view Hindle-Milne inference. You know, yeah. it's totally. I mean, actually, I've implemented all this in, in Chameleon and stuff. But, but it, it's it, because uh, GHC at the moment easily breaks under uh, small rewrites. It's very fragile. That's uh, a real problem in practice, I believe. And if you could, have, uh, so I'm not sure, right? But if this is not as fragile as you seem to imply, right? Yes. I, I think that would be a, a good argument. But yeah, I, I see that it's a it's a big deviation from what's there now. It's not a cheap way, huh? But I mean, effectively, what, what 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 I'm saying here is you have to start rewriting your front end from scratch. You know, you have to really throw away everything what you have there. So, and this is something which, when you talk to Simon Payton Jones. <laughs> He's reluctant to do, you know. But on, the other, but on the other hand, when you're arguing earlier that you've looked at real programs that use GDTs yeah. and to see if they need this or yeah. whatever, you've only looked at the ones that people finally managed to get to work with GHC. Yes. Right, and so you didn't look at all the ones no, you tried. No, of course. I mean, you weren't able to the, the, the problem is there's not enough experience with, with, with that programming feature. I mean, in two years' time, it could say it's just not good enough, you know, that, that cheap solution in, in, in GHC. But I myself don't have enough experience. I have contrived examples which precisely point out the problem. And I have some reasonable examples that say, well, even if this is just solving a contrived problem, even for type error diagnosis, it's, it's highly useful. And this is really all something which comes from, uh, from the proof theory, where, where people are trying to use abduction to, to, uh, to fix proofs. So, uh, OK, so effectively now I showed you uh, GAT's examples, why they're useful. Okay, and uh, talked about the GAT inference, and I'm looking at, uh, at uh, back-end issues. And, uh, sorry. Um, so as I said, many compilers actually are translated to system F. It's just a classic way, so GHC or Flint and so on. Now, the first question would be, can we just naively translate GATs to system F? Do we need anything else? And of course, already you, 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 you run into trouble, because uh, if I just throw away these equality guards, uh, it, I, I lose uh, uh, type preservation. So my source program, which has the GAD type system, is correct. But here you see, of course, if I would translate this naively to, to system F, uh, sorry, actually, that's the end list of AN is missing. This is actually very crucial, OK? Because of course, in system F, it wouldn't be well typed, because it says for any M and a N. And of course, it would be something which is, 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 is too polymorphic, OK? So we definitely have to extend system F somehow. And um, a brute force method would simply be, well, let's just add GDTs to system F, you know? Seems to be the reasonable choice. We have a new language feature. We, we just add it to the internal language. But the problem is really that uh, 
the core language is already quite big in, 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 uh, in, in, uh, in GHC. And GHC has a lot of other extensions like type classes and type functions and so on. So you really do not know where do I stop here. You know, Do I add type class to system F? Do I add uh, type function to system F? So we would like really a fairly principled uh, system F extension which is powerful enough to, to let's say, uh, host a variety of, of source language features. Okay? Now, what if we simply apply the proofs or programs principles? Okay? Because effectively, if you think about it, that these equality guards, they allow us to change types. Okay? So I could just maybe attach proof terms to, to these type equations. Okay? And here's now the, the first initial step. What I'm doing is here, I, this is the first attempt. I encode uh, type equality by using uh, coercion functions, casting functions. Okay? I say A equals B if I actually have a function from A to B and from B to A. Okay? Sounds, sounds reasonable, isn't it? Okay? Now, when I have my, my GDT from before, effectively what I'm doing is I'm compiling away all these equality guards and I'm replacing effectively these, these type equalities via this, this now value representation of, of type equality. Okay, so in fact here base and step, for instance, base, I, I pass here additionally the proof that W is actually equal to Z, and I pass in the proof that X is equal, equal to Y. Okay? The good thing is we just need system F here, no extension. I mean system F with, with uh, boxed extension types. Okay, I'm not sure whether you see it. So technically it's really, it's possible actually to translate that append program to the internal form where we effectively, each time we're using a, a type equation, what we'll do is, in fact, we're using the respective casting function, okay? But it's extremely clumsy, okay? And we have to sometimes really program it ourselves. So, for instance, here, I need a casting function that says, if successor of A equals successor of B, we do know from logic, of course, that A equals B, and I have to program it myself, okay? So the problem is here, there is a lot of runtime overhead. There's a technical problem, which is a decomposition problem, which I just skip. So it is not practical, you know. It's it's definitely not 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 not, not practical. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 you could say that if you have these equality constraints, you always know that all the casts are identities, and you can have uh, like the work uh, that's been done on um, uh, how is it called? Um, by, by uh, well, I forgot his name, but uh, uh, he first made these equality data types, and they're always identity functions these cars. So you could always yes. I, you know, erase them away, and you can actually have laws on all the cars. So the, 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 the problem, the problem here is really it, it doesn't quite work because you really, uh, I know you want to have the new type trick, you know, where you have uh, you want to encode Leibniz equality. That's what you're re referring to. Uh, yeah, and you can even do it. In system F, right? So just assume it, it's there, you know, in, uh, implemented by primitives. Yeah, but that's not okay. Effectively, that's in fact what, what, what we're doing. You know, I just wanted to say this is something which is possible, but not very principled, and it's 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 not practical. Yeah. So, so the runtime overhead you're mentioning there, I mean, that's really, I mean, you can throw all this stuff away, right? Because you don't need to preserve this in the runtime. Well, the thing is, we only just need this to preserve well typing. I mean, right. for instance, we okay. What is the issue here? The issue is we do know if the source program type checks, we have a soundness result that says the 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 uh, the backend will never crash. Okay, but in a type preserving compiler, I mean, we want to preserve the types. And of course, the issue is here that system F the intermediate stuff is not anymore well typed. When you mean runtime, you mean in the compiler or when yes. you run the code? Yeah, no, here you mean in the compiler. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, Sorry. because here no, also when we run the code, when we run the code, because here. You can you can erase all this stuff just before you run the code. That is, you of course, but it's but you have to in fact figure out where you're going to erase it and these kind of things, you know. So I, as I said, it's it's possible in theory, but in my opinion, it's not practical. Okay. So I understand what you say is whenever would, I would have a call to a cast function, I do know it effectively evaluates the identity. So even I don't bother calling it. Okay. It's possible, but I think it it's there's actually a a much easier way, okay? And the basic idea is now if you know, actually I show you for the first time that GDD typing rule, okay? Which I always was expressing in terms of, 
implications, okay? And this is, in fact, the typing rule which allows us to change the type. So, in fact, here I'm using a, 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 a uh, formulation where we have C is a set of constraints, gamma is the typing environment, and under these two guys we can assign E the type, let's say, T2, okay? But if we actually can, can verify that under the constraints C, we can actually prove that the type T1 equals to, sorry, I was going the wrong way, okay? I should say the EQ, look at the, the, the premise of that rule. If we do know that E has type T1, and if we can conclude from the constraint that the type T1 equals to T2, of course, then we can conclude that E has the type T2 as well. From before, there was our example where we had zero is an integer, we knew that A equals int, and from that, in fact, we can conclude that that zero is also of type A, okay? Now, the trick here, what we're doing is here, we're not using now these value coercions anymore. We're just, in fact, using coercions as types, okay? Because, as you argued, we can throw them away. And actually, in, 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 uh, in any type of specific compiler, eventually, we're going to throw away all the types, okay? So they are only there up to a certain point, then we're going to throw away the types. But we don't want to do it at runtime, you know. We, don't, we want to do it when, when we get the final output. And that's, in fact, now pretty much the, the new uh, GHD internal language. The trick is here. We, we're having now kinds which describe uh, type equations, and we assign types to these kinds which are type equations. So effectively, the coercion is now a, a type, and we have, new, we have a new typing rule which simply allows us to do some sort of type casting. That means if we can prove, this would be in the internal language, if we actually can prove that from C, we can conclude that T1 equals T2, then there will be this type co coercion C, and we simply have a cast which allows us to turn E, which is of type T1, into E, which is of type T2, okay? Now, of course, this thing here, this cast here, is something which we only need to, to preserve the types. And eventually what we'll do is we just throw it away, okay? It's very similar how we, for instance, do it with, uh, with polymorphism when we have type application and, uh, and type abstraction. So effectively also then in any type of serving compiler, eventually you're going to just throw it away, okay, the type. So it's, it's pretty much then the same thing. And that's also then written up in a paper, so I won't have so much time to talk about this. Yes? Um, are you sure that... Um, this only occurs in the, the core language, right? So you can't write your own um, inhabitants for T1 equals to T2. So, I mean, the question is if bottom always lives in T1 and T2, so you're always sure that you can do this coercion, right? Yes. No, it's trusted. It's effectively it's con a constructive proof system. So just think about it's an equality type proof system, and I have a bunch of initial assumptions like C. And effectively, what, what it's doing is we're just applying now Curry Howard. And these C's are nothing else than proof terms, which represent the proof that, that T1 equals T2. And they're just living in the type language because we're going to get rid of them. I'm not sure whether you asked this question. Um, yeah, so how do you know that your proof terms aren't bottom? There is no bottom. Well, well, you mean false. You mean like something is, is false. Undefined. Well, the only thing which is undefined would be false, like if I have int equals bool. So in that, that would be something which would be, I, I can't see that there is anything like undefined. I mean, if I have false, I don't need any proof, proof term, you know, because uh, from false I can I conclude anything, you know. If I, sorry, if I have here something which, from which I can conclude false, it means that C itself must be inconsistent. And if C is in, inconsistent, I can assign any type, you know, then I'm already, and remember, if, if C is inconsistent, I will never ever enter that, that, that uh, program code because it f effectively means uh, I cannot build a value, you know, because it's inconsistent. What Walter is worried about is if, if I can build a term C that it has C, the, this yeah. type that actually doesn't terminate, right, which, which if you're not careful, you can. No, okay, maybe never. Then, yep. then you can give it this type, and in, since you're going to erase it at runtime, you're going to skip the non-terminating part, and you're going to get to the bad case in the program, right? But we never evaluate C, you know? So, so, so if, if, like in ML, you can, I can define a cast function from alpha to beta by 
but making a function that says, you know, throw exception or run mm -hmm. run forever, okay? So take the run forever case, right? You can basically give that any type I want. Mm -hmm. In particular, I could give it type t1 equals t2, right? Okay, but that's, that theory, of course, okay, there's a soundness result that says the theory must be consistent. It includes non-termination tests for, for these coercion terms. I don't really see... So I, have I, think a very I think the coercion terms are built in. You cannot write your own Cs. No, they're really... Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. okay. I, can't I mean, I, yeah. I, I was... Maybe what I was trying to say is that we have here a type equality proof system, and effectively all what I'm saying is we, we, we derive the proof, you know? own coercion and prove them correctly. Yes, but well you can, you know, you can actually have your own coercion but it must satisfy conditions. Like termination. Yes. So, so the language for E and the language for C are different languages, right? Yes, of course. Okay. Yes. I mean, the language for C is yeah. look, by nature. There, there are huge gaps here, you know, it's just like highlights of, of the ideas. I mean, I, I didn't tell you anything about how, how, C, how C actually uh, looks like, you know. So effectively, it, it's it's just a very simple language. We just use, use types. So and I mean, we won't be evaluated anyway. So in, the interesting thing is, I just thought I, I'll mention it. This effectively will, will be new, the new GHC core language. And the funny thing is, of course, you see now that we we have a version of of System F where we attach proofs to our programs. I mean, here we have a proof that that T1 equals T2. So uh, so. So, so that GHC internal language is really shifting to becoming a, almost like a, one of these uh, categories of constructions and so on. So it's, you can do then fancy things. And the good thing is, of course, it looks like a very uniform uh, system F variant, which is powerful enough to host GDTs and type classes and type functions. So, okay. Anyway, so I was, I mean, here I have an example. I just skip it because I'm running. I mean, I'm already running late. Uh, okay, so the main point is that these GLTs are really, I think, a cool tool. And as I said, it's not only for toy languages like Haskell, but I think they also uh, are av available in, in C Sharp. And effectively, it means really programming with with, with proofs. Okay, but the, the the important point is you don't get a, you, don't, you don't get everything for free, you know, because you might still have to reason about proofs. And it's just too clumsy to do it. In theory, you can do it but you still might need an external proof assistant. And uh, the GHC inference is really challenging, but there's really some hope. I, I believe that the idea with Herbert constraint abduction really allows to specify a tractable type uh, inference system. And in particular, the type error diagnosis, is, you, you, you get that for free. Um, I just sketched then also this extension of system F plus type equality co coercion. I didn't mention anything like type functions or whatever, but GHCs can be translated. I should also mention there are other solutions possible, like intentional type analysis. And I think you're from Nottingham, and I think uh, Connor McBride with somebody else he has even a different proposal. I think there's a huge variety of, of system F-style language that we can choose from. So I'm, the same thing could be expressed differently. So, oops. And uh, actually, in practice, I believe that GATs are not powerful enough because we need the combination of type class and type functions. but. I'll be around, f and you might want to ask me, and I can give you a demo of my Canadian system. So that's it. Sorry for being 50 minutes late. <laughs>